We are, of course, back in the book of Daniel. I'm excited to be in the book of Daniel. I hope you are. Uh, in, the next four, in the next four weeks, we will be looking at chapters four and five. So two weeks in chapter four, two weeks in chapter five. We've just concluded chapter three. So tonight, we will be looking at Daniel chapter 4, 1 through 18. And I would invite you to turn there in your Bibles. So I assume you have them. Um, as we know, if we just do a little review, the book of Daniel can be divided uh, into three parts. Uh, the judgment of the Jews, prophetic warning to the Gentiles, and prophetic warning to the back to the Jews. Those are sections written in languages, different languages, so that's how we break them up. One is Hebrew, then it's Aramaic, then it's Hebrew again. We've concluded the judgment of the Jews, essentially the fall of Jerusalem in the first chapter. And we are now in the Aramaic section. Uh, we've done chapter 2 and chapter 3, and now we're going to hit chapter 4. So we are in that part of the outline. If we outline the book of Daniel further, it looks something like this, and we're in the red section, the prophetic warning to the Gentiles, and we are in C and D, so we will do uh, chapter four for two weeks, as I said, and then chapter five for two weeks, and that's what we're going to do for the next four weeks, following along, moving in or out. To get going this week, let's look at the structure of chapter 4. So that's kind of the structure of the book if we divide it by languages. But chapter 4 also has a structure that helps us as we step through the events of chapter 4. So we'll then look at the structure and then look at our passage. Okay, so the structure is this. There's five parts or five sections in chapter 4. And they're pretty self-explanatory. The first one, though, is a little different. It's a summary, three verses, and it's a summary of the whole thing. So really, the story that we're going to be looking at does not begin in verse 1. It begins in verse 4. But before that, Nebuchadnezzar pray, um, praises God and gives a summary of what occurred. So the first part is a summary, and then we get to the actual narrative where we have a second dream by Nebuchadnezzar, and then there is Daniel interpreting the second dream, Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation, where it, I say he became on the outside what he was already on the inside, a beast, and then his restoration. So we are going to look at A uh, and B this time around, beginning, of course, with A, and, and we'll get with the summary, and then we'll get into our text. So here is the summary, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. So this then is the beginning of the chapter, but it's a summary. It's not really the beginning of the narrative. And we have here really the main point of what Nebuchadnezzar has learned, and in many ways, it's the main point of Daniel. You will remember, remember when we did the, the intro to Daniel and we looked at the history kind of of the region and the fall of Jerusalem and all of that, there was a phrase that we, was repeated and shown to happen over and over again. Do you remember that phrase? It's in Daniel chapter 2, 20 and 22. I, I asked for a show of hands, but that won't work, so I'm just going to tell you, all right? So it is, he removes kings and sets up kings. And we are seeing this in the book of Daniel. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. 
he removes kings and sets up kings. And we're going to see this again in our narrative today, in our passage. But this time, I think we'll notice that there's a new humility in the king. So what's going on, right? Well, we'll see what's going on by reading the rest of our passage. That would be uh, 4 through 18. But we, when we do that, we want to remember that important thing is context. It's really, really important to have in the back of your mind context, because context is king, right? It'll, it really clues you in on some of the nuances. So what's the context of Daniel chapter 4? What is it? Well, how about Daniel chapter 2 and 3? So in Daniel chapter 2, we found that God showed him a dream of a great multi-metal image and a stone cut without hands out of heaven that crushed the image. None of the wise men could interpret it because, well, the king wouldn't tell them what the dream was, so what are they going to do? But instead of killing all, everybody, Daniel was able to interpret. That's the context of, from Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 3, we have Nebuchadnezzar setting up a massive golden idol. Now, we remember the image that he had in the dream. The head was gold, the arms were silver, etc. It was multi-metal. And we knew from that interpretation that the gold part was Nebuchadnezzar. So he takes that a little step further and decides to make a big statue, all gold, maybe of himself. And he compels everyone to worship it at pain of death in a fiery furnace. Well, we see then God reveals himself in the midst of the fiery furnace because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, would not bow down and worship. They were then given a second chance, and they said, we don't, we know this one. And they threw him into the fiery furnace where the Son of God was revealed. There was a fourth person in there, and he saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So this is the context of what is now we're going to see in chapter 4. So amazing dream, amazing events, and now a new dream. However, quite a bit of time has passed between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. So let's see what God is up to. In chapter 4, we see that... Uh, there's been a change, a massive change in the king, and he records it. And we then begin seeing him writing in the first person. We see with statements like, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at the ease of my house. I saw a dream. I lay in bed. I made a decree. He is writing this, and he's writing it about himself. So that's one of the changes. But then, we, as I said, some time has passed between the fiery furnace in chapter 3 and now the beginning of chapter 4 with the second dream. And we really don't know how much time. There are no time markers because there's nothing that's just chapter 3 and then chapter 4. So there's, it's difficult to figure out uh, how much time has elapsed. Now, in a couple weeks... When we look at the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, we will look at the time frame, and we'll look at that more closely and try to get a feel for what's happening. But in that, just a heads up, uh, in the gap between the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5, four kings come and go, mostly through assassination between the end of chapter 4 and the, end of chap and the beginning of chapter 5. But that's another lesson. Uh, I just want to give you a teaser on that. So let's see what God is doing in chapter 4. Uh, in, in our time frame, I believe that the Nebuchadnezzar has been king for a long time, maybe 30, 35 years. He has had time to build a massive empire, a massive Babylon, all the hanging, tower, hanging gardens of Babylon and all that. It's been 25, maybe 30 years since the fiery furnace, right? That happened early in his reign. And uh, Daniel, who was a teenager when he was captive and brought 
in with the first captivity is now 45, 50 years old maybe. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar we see is in his palace. He's relishing all that he's accomplished. And he writes, you can see it, I, am in, I was at ease in my house. I was kicking back. I, everything was good. The, the enemies were subdued. The kingdom was thriving. There was wealth and uh, prosperity and kind of Pax Nebuchadnezzar, the, the peace of Nebuchadnezzar. And so we have then in one through three, Nebuchadnezzar praises God and sees a summary. And then we get to uh, his second dream. And, and we pick it up in verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians and the enchanters and the Chaldeans and the astrologers came in and I told them the dream, unlike the last time, but they could not make known to me the interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belteshazzar after the name of my God and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream saying, oh, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a great tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was, all, it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches. All the flesh was fed from it. And I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed and behold, and behold a watcher, a holy one came down from heaven. So verse 13, I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed and behold a watcher, a holy one came down from heaven. Now, if this were a movie, this is where the music would start swelling and getting spooky. And go, doo, 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 doo. You know how they do that, right? Mark Hen, you know how they do that. So we have him talking now and introducing this character, a watcher. And the watcher proclaimed, he proclaimed aloud and said thus, chop down the tree, lop off its branches, strip off its leaves, Scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the field. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let the beast's mind be given to him and let seven periods of time pass over him. Dun, dun, dun. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. And Nebuchadnezzar concludes, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw. And you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation. 
because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. Really? Do you think they can't figure it out? I bet you can figure it out. I bet you already have figured out this tree. But they told him they couldn't. Maybe they wouldn't. And he takes them at their word and says, okay, but you, Daniel, I know you're able because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. This then is the passage that we're looking at, verses 1 through 18 in chapter 4. So let's unpack it a little bit. But it is not rocket science. In our passage, 1 through 18, we have two sections. Nebuchadnezzar praises God, that summary, and the second dream, 4 through 18. The first few verses of 1 through 3 can be seen really as the end result of the story, not the beginning of the story. It's kind of like a flashback. The content of chapter 4 really begins with the last verse of chapter 4, verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. That's really the end of the summary kind of thing. And then it kind of goes like in the loop from 37 back to 1, 1, 2, 3. But here in 37, who is he referring to? It's obvious, no? He's referring to himself. He's writing in the first person. And there is a person who has been humbled. He is the person who was humbled. So with that perspective, let's look then at the beginning. I, King, or King Nebuchadnezzar, to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. You know what? This is not hyperbole. Right? He was. He was the king of the earth, of the known earth. I'm, I'm sure there were people in the Orient and in Africa that were not part of his own domain, et cetera. But for the known earth, he, he's the guy. And he's writing to the, all people's nations and languages that he knows about that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. This is a good proclamation. They're going to want to hear about it. And he says in verse 2, It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. The signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. Wow. Please understand, this monotheistic concept was entirely foreign to the entire world at this time. A single God who ruled over all the kingdoms of the earth? That was completely counter to the universal belief at the time, that each nation, sometimes cities, had its own unique god or deities that controlled the city or the nation, the region's fate. So here we have Nebuchadnezzar accepting that one god, the Most High God, ruled over all the nations and kingdoms on earth. And that god is the god of the Jews. And it's personal. Nebuchadnezzar wants everyone to know what, quote unquote, God has done for me. This is sounding like global evangelism, don't you think? Maybe this is the first evangelism track ever written. It's from the king of the known world to everybody, all the people's nations and languages that dwell on the earth. And he writes, how great are his signs, how mighty his works. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to end of generation. This is an amazing statement, especially coming from such a ruler, humanly speaking, the ruler of the known world, massive. 
as we've already noted in our context, but I want to stress it, God is dealing with Nebuchadnezzar, right? In chapter 4, it's the third time the king has had God knocking on his heart. The first time we saw was the, the dream, the great multi-metal image, and the stone from heaven, and Daniel's interpretation, right? And then we had the golden item, an idol and the fiery furnace and the Son of God in the midst of it saving the three Jews. And now, for the third time, God is trying to get through to Nebuchadnezzar with another dream, a, third, a second dream. And this time, I think it worked. Look again at what he writes at the beginning and the end of chapter 4. At the end, he writes, 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. And then, of course, the beginning in verse 3, How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And his dominion endures from generation to generation. Just look at that. Do you think it is possible here that the king of the world, Nebuchadnezzar, has humbled himself and become a believer? It kind of sounds that way, don't you think? Look at what he wrote. Look at what he's saying. And then at, at, in an overflow, he's telling everybody about it because he just can't hold it in. Now, he certainly hasn't openly become a Jew. He hasn't, to our knowledge, been circumcised or anything like that. But he is honoring and worshiping the God of the Jews. And this is, by the way, the last we hear from Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. In the next chapter, chapter 5, we are introduced to a totally new king. King Belshazzar, not to be confused with Belteshazzar, not Daniel. This is just a guy whose name is very similar. And that does actually confuse some people. So what has happened here? Well, I think Nebuchadnezzar humbled himself. I think he believed all the revelation that he had. He believed everything that God had revealed to him thus far, and he repented, in my opinion. If this is true, and he did, then chapter 4 is the only passage that I know of in Scripture that was written by a new believer. Think about that. It's interesting anyway. We just might see him in heaven. And I hope so. For, if for no other reason other than hell is such an amazingly horrible, horrible concept and place. And there is no exit. So I hope we see him in heaven. All right, so this ends the summary, right? The summary of Nebuchadnezzar praising God. So let's see what got him there. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, but the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Just a note here. These wise guys, the Chaldeans and the astrologers and all the people, they weren't just hanging around the palace waiting for the king to ask them a question. These were more, these were like the scholars. They were the brain trust. And my thought is that they were spread out around the empire, or certainly not all congregated in Babylon, because he has to make a decree that they all come back to Babylon, right? They should come to the palace. And so they are all then brought before him, he says. And it says in verse 7, he sends out the decree and they all obey. And then the magicians and the enchanters and the Chaldeans and the astrologers, verse 7, they come in and then he, he writes, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. A couple obvious things here. The first 
is the king is very frightened. That's kind of obvious because he says it. It made me afraid. The dream has so frightened him, he is no longer withholding the dream from the interpreters like he did before. Now, of course, that was years ago, and maybe he had already changed and, you know, made their life easier, probably. But in any case, he is so afraid that he doesn't bother withholding the dream from the interpreters. He commands that they all return to the capital city, and he wants to hear from them, and he tells them the dream. That's verse 7, right? I told them the dream, and they could not make known to me its interpretation. Do you think it is possible that Nebuchadnezzar was so frightened by the dream because he already knew or suspected its meaning? There's really not a whole lot frightening in the dream about cutting down a tree unless you think there's kind of a personal message there. and You are the king. You are the tree. So I'm wondering if he did actually have kind of a suspicion on what was going on, and he wanted someone to tell him different. And yet inside his heart of hearts, there was fear. Verse 8. At last, Daniel came in before me, he writes. He, who was named Belteshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Let's stop right there for a moment, right? There is nowhere ever that I know of where pagan deities are called holy. That is not something that describes any pagan deity, right? Holy is reserved for our God. But this is a pagan king, or at least a Gentile king, who writes the spirit of the holy gods. Now, this is in Aramaic. Is this translated the same way? Well, yes, it is. This is the Aramaic of it, Kaddish. And you know what it means? Holy. It means separate, set apart. It's very, very similar to what we might see in Hebrew or Greek. It is holy. It is separate. And holy is reserved for our God, most high God. And interestingly, if you look, this term here for God is plural. And he says, Daniel, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Why is this plural? And it is plural. It's Elah in Aramaic, which corresponds to Elohim in Hebrew. I don't know if you realize it, but Elohim in Hebrew is plural. The word is translated gods. Why plural? God is plural. Remember the Trinity, right? If you go in, in Genesis with the creation, it's God is plural, and it's Elohim. Elohim. So verse 8 continues... Daniel came in before me, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you. That's the second time he says the same thing. There's no mistake here. And, know that, and, and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. And then, just to be clear, verse 10, the visions of my head as I lay in my bed were these. And he goes on to tell everybody who's listening what he saw in his dream that made him so frightened. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth. Well, as nightmares go, that's pretty tame. And its height was great. And the tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. 
The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heaven lived in its branches and all flesh was fed from it. This is an awesome tree. It's a tree of blessing. So, you're Daniel. What does this mighty tree represent? Can you figure that out? I'm pretty sure you can. I'm pretty sure you already have. This is this tree, this mighty tree, this tree of blessing that everything can see it and it's so high and all the blessings and the birds and everybody eats from it. Right? Who is that? That's Nebuchadnezzar. It's obvious, right? And I'm pretty sure he suspected it was himself. I have no way of knowing that except by his reaction. I think maybe the wise men knew too. They were, after all, wise men. If you figured it out, maybe at their first reading, they probably did too. But they didn't have the courage to tell the king the meaning of the dream. They remembered back when there was this other dream and he didn't want to tell us about it and that didn't work out so well. They almost killed us. So let's, let's, let's just pass on this. Maybe Daniel will come in and we can get rid of him. Verse 13. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. What is that? This is the only passage in scripture where this exact term is used to describe uh, an angel, a holy one, who came down from heaven. There is one passage where the word watcher in Job occurs, but it has nothing to do with angels. Uh, and yet there is something in Ephesians that I call our attention to. Ephesians 3, 10, about heavenly beings watching. Who are they watching? They're watching the church. And we see this in Ephesians 3, 10. What do they see? So that through the church, it says, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. These rulers and authorities in the heavenly places are watching and learning about God by watching the church and seeing God's, what it says is manifold wisdom. That term is many colored. They're learning about God. They're learning about his multidimensional, multifaceted, many-colored wisdom as they, as they observe the mystery of the church. It's the only thing close to what we find here in Daniel 4.14. He proclaimed the watcher aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree, lop off its branches, Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under the it and the birds from its branches. Even the shade is gone. All of the blessings of the tree are removed. It's wiped out. But a little hope, verse 15, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with the band of iron and bronze, amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. What? Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Ah, it's a him. Did you catch that? Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the field. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him. Pretty sure Nebuchadnezzar suspected who the him is. And it's kind of harsh. Let the beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. How long is that? I don't know. Seven. I don't, I, it could be seven years. There are people who say it's seven years, but Aramaic has a perfectly good word for year and day and month, just like we do. 
I think if it were intending to communicate seven years, it would have been clearer to say, well, and let seven years pass over him, but it doesn't say that. It says seven units of time, seven periods of time, and it doesn't define for us those periods. So really, I don't want to be dogmatic on how much time it is. We know it's a unit, there's seven of them. I'm not sure of the duration, right? But it was long enough for him to change into a beast-like creature. Why do this? Pilate says in verse 17, and why? The sentence is by the decree of the watchers. The decision by the word of the holy ones. To the end, this is the why, that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. That's the why. Interesting verse. I don't think a lot of politicians claim this verse as their life's verse, right? He rules over the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Verse 18, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw. And you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation. Because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you, Daniel, I, I'm trusting you can do it. You are able for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. And please give me some good news here because it's scaring me. This is our passage, 1 through 18. I think it's obvious. So how do we apply this to us? Well, let's remember the instructions we have in the New Testament in 1 Peter 5 and in James 4. Here we find both a warning and an encouragement. 1 Peter 5.5 5. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. For James 4, kind of the same thing. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. A little teaser from American history. King George III was the king of England and Ireland during the American Revolution. He reigned from his coronation on October 25th, 1760, until his death in 1820. He was firmly the king during the American Revolution. There is a growing volume of evidence that he, like Nebuchadnezzar, went mad. Same kind of thing. And I bet it really impacted uh, England and its response in the American Revolution. In fact, there is a long-running play which opened first in 1991, followed by an award-winning film which came out in 1994 titled The Madness of King George. I understand in Britain, children's history books still refer to King George as the mad king who lost America. How'd you like that? George is said to have had episodes, and this is written in notes by his personal physicians. He became seriously deranged, sometimes speaking for many hours without pause, causing him to foam at the mouth. There was lots of weird things that they wrote. One of the more extreme stories involves King George confusing a tree for the king of Prussia and trying to go and shake hands with it. There's lots in it. You, If you have a chance to see the movie, 
or the play, you should. The movie is actually kind of funny in a dark humor kind of way. But mostly we should remember this. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. And then, of course, from our passage, the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Let's pray. God, it is timely as we approach our presidential elections and all of the absolute craziness, violence, manipulation, and all the rest that we're seeing and not seeing, we ask mercy upon us. We humble ourselves before you and cry mercy and ask that you, uh, that you will really save this country and help us, oh God. And that we all, as we have relationships with one another, would remember that you are opposed to the proud and give grace to the humble, that we might humble ourselves before you. In Jesus' name, amen.